I had to impose a sense of urgency into the department. There wasn't a guidebook or, or a map or some program that said, here's how you do this. Imagine a man who is completely pragmatic. He is smarter and more cunning than most men. He may respect the talents of a few, but overall he has little concern over the condition of mankind. He has observed that kings and politicians are always fighting over something and has concluded that wars are inevitable. He is also well aware that wars can be profitable, not only by lending or creating the money to finance them, but from government favouritism in the granting of commercial subsidies or monopolies. He is not capable of primitive feelings such as patriotism, so he is free to participate in the funding of any side of any conflict, limited only by factors of self-interest. If such a man were to survey the world around him, it is not difficult to imagine that his career would be guided by the following blueprint. Law 1. War is the ultimate test of any government. If it can successfully meet the challenge of war, it will survive. If it cannot, it will perish. All else is secondary. The sanctity of its laws, the prosperity of its citizens, and even the solvency of its treasury. Law 2. All that is necessary to ensure that a government will maintain or expand its debt is to involve it in war or the threat of war. The greater the threat and the more destructive the war, the greater the need for debt. Law 3. In order to involve a country in war, or the threat of war, it will be necessary for it to have enemies with credible military might. If such enemies already exist, all the better. If they exist but lack military strength, it will be necessary to provide them with the money required to build their war machine. If an enemy does not exist at all, then it will be necessary to create one by financing the rise of a hostile regime. Law 4. The ultimate obstacle is a government which declines to finance its wars through debt. Although this seldom happens, when it does, it will be necessary to encourage internal political opposition or a revolution to replace that government with one that is more compliant to your will. The assassination of heads of state could play an important role in this process. Law 5. No nation can be allowed to remain stronger than its adversaries, for that could lead to peace and a reduction of debt. To accomplish this so-called balance of power, it may be necessary to finance both sides of the conflict. We're exporting dollars abroad that are going to both uh, provide, we first have to pay for our troops to be abroad, and then the monies that we send abroad work their way through the madrasas and into the hands of the very enemies who are going after our men and women abroad as well. Unless one of the combatants is hostile to our interests and therefore must be destroyed, neither side should be allowed a decisive victory or defeat. While you must always proclaim the virtues of peace, the unspoken objective is perpetual war. By following this blueprint, you can have it all, and then some. That was an interest pun, by the way. However, this does not mean that you should finance every warlike group that comes along. It depends on who they threaten and how likely they are to succeed. Let's take a look at a case study. Let's get the people going! In 1830, the Dutch were facing an uprising from their subjects in Belgium. Both the ruling government and the revolutionaries were dependent on the Rothschilds for financing their conflict. The Dutch rulers were reliable customers for loans and, just as importantly, were reliable in their payment of interest on these loans. It would be foolish to provide more than token assistance to the rebels who, if they came to power, likely would have refused to honour the debts of the former puppet regime. Solomon Rothschild explained, These gentlemen should not count on us unless they decide to follow a line of prudence and moderation. Our goodwill does not yet extend to the point of putting clubs into the hands that would beat us, that is, lending money to make war and ruin the credit that we sustain with all our efforts and all our means. In this case, the revolution was resolved by negotiation, Rather than by arms, still, the new government in Brussels was a natural target for financial takeover. In fact, James Rothschild outlined the strategy that has become the model of such operations ever since. Now is the moment of which we should take advantage to make ourselves absolute masters of that country's finances. The first step will be to establish ourselves on an intimate footing with Belgium's new finance minister to gain his confidence and to take all the treasury bonds he may offer us. Wars, both great and small, have always been a plague to Europe, but it was not until they were easy to finance through central banking and fiat money that they became virtually perpetual. The Bank of England, for example, was founded in 1694 for the specific purpose of financing a war. Since then, as we can see, war was commonplace in Europe. In addition to these European conflicts, there were also two wars with America, 
the War for Independence and the War of 1812. In the 126 years between 1689 and 1815, England was at war for 63 of them. That is one out of every two years in combat, the others were spent preparing for combat. Whether ending in victory or defeat, the outcome merely preserved or restored the European balance of power. And the most permanent result of any of these wars? Expanded government debt for all parties.